Let's talk for a minute about jump scares. I know I've probably gone over this maybe several times, but it bears repeating because uh, some of you will think this is splitting hairs, but uh, it helps to know why they are as stupid as they are. It helps to know, uh, it helps to understand, it helps you to understand how cinema works, how the human mind works, and how you get invested in a movie, like a horror movie or a comedy, stuff like that. Um, jump scares are the lowest form of horror. They are the they are the equivalent of the pie in the face of comedy. It's it's what you do. It's it's the basis level of fright. Okay, uh, it's it's the mark of extraordinarily weak storytelling. When you can't think of something scary to do, when you can't think of a good way to set an atmosphere, you simply have something very quickly lurch out at the at the camera, accompanied by a absolutely deafening, uh, or at least deafening in contrast to the very quiet action of what's going on in the scene. All of a sudden, there's a huge orchestra sting, and you leap out of your seat, and you're like, oh my god, that was scary. Here's the thing, though. It's not scary. It's startling. It's like, see, that wasn't, that wasn't scary. That was startling. <laughs> That's not horror. That is me just grabbing your ear and yelling into it very loudly. That's not horror. That doesn't take any talent. Now, that's not to say that jump scares don't have their place. They do, because the pie in the face is funny. You know, it's it's funny watching someone get humiliated. It doesn't take any talent to throw a pie in the face, but it's funny. You know, I can't deny that, uh, you know, you, you'd get a laugh out of seeing that. But there's a rate of diminishing returns when it comes to the pie in the face uh, or the jump scare. Now, as with Family Guy, there is kind of a, there's a there's almost like a, a, a sine wave where you can actually drive the gag so far into the ground and torture it and torture it and torture it to where it just kind of becomes pathetically funny. But that's not what I'm talking about. Um, when it comes to the jump scare, there's only a certain number of times you can do it before it becomes irritating. And the I think what a lot of people misunderstand is that... You can be scared of a movie, but it's not because you're scared of the movie. It's because you're simply scared of the loud noises. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're really not wanting to see the movie, but it's not because you're scared. It's because there's going to be another loud fucking noise, and I, it, I'm going to jump because it scares the... It's, it's, it, if I yelled in your ear, you'd... you'd freak the fuck out. You'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? But you'd be pissed. If I kept doing it, you'd be pissed off. So you can do it and it's scary, but you can only do it once, twice, maybe three times. And here's the key. It's actually better, far better when you do it only twice, because when you do it twice, you're a f that's where the fear comes from. When you show restraint and you make those scares, you make them worth it. You make those scares where anything could leap out at you at any time, but it doesn't. And it doesn't. And it doesn't. And it doesn't. And then it does! That's where the payoff comes, you know? So, this is where I'm coming from when I say uh, jump scares are terrible. And if you're going to do them, only do them a few times. Now... This leads into the two movies I saw this week. Sinister and Paranormal Activity 4. I was really expecting to like Paranormal Activity 4, so I had this whole bit kind of planned out in my head where I was going to talk about one and the other. Turns out they're both kind of in the same boat. In the sense that they are both utterly and completely reliant on jump scares. Um... I guess I'll get to Sinister later, because I'm sure... I think most of you guys want to hear my thoughts on Paranormal Activity. So, okay. Um, suffice to say that uh, I was hearing bad things about Paranormal 4, but I was expecting that. I was expecting... Uh, a lot of people aren't in the Paranormal Activity boat. Uh, I am. So I've always been a mark for the series, much like 
Uh, I don't like the Saw series, and I, I don't think critics like the Saw series at all. But if you're if you're invested in the series, you're pretty much hooked. You know, every time there's going to be a Saw movie, you're going to go see it. Like like Cinema Snob, you know. I don't even really think he likes the movies anymore, but he got four deep into it. He got four movies into the series. It's like, I gotta see how it ends, you know. And he liked the first bunch, so... You're like, you know, maybe they'll catch the lightning in a bottle again. They'll do it again. So he kind of sat through them. It, it was almost an obligation. Now, it was an obligation for me with Paranormal Activity. I liked them. I liked the first three, even when people said it kind of went too far. Uh, but, no, I dug them. And this... Paranormal Activity 4 sucks. It sucks astonishingly bad. And this is coming from a guy who cut, you know, two and three slack. Everyone was saying, like, oh, it's repetitive. It stretched, you know, it stretched the premise to its limits. Stretched it beyond its limits. It's repetitive, you know. Um, I stuck up for it. And this is where the gimmick not only jumps the rails, it crashes into a school and explodes. It goes way too far. And here's why. And I know I've said this before, but I have to explain why it doesn't work here. I've always said the Paranormal Activity series, uh, it's the only reason it's any good, only reason, and this goes with any found footage movie, only reason they work is because you could conceivably believe that the footage you're seeing is real. I'm not saying I do believe it. I'm not saying that you ever would. I'm saying you could see in this reality videos hitting the internet that are, like, you see this shit and you're like, oh my god, did that, like, you could, there's enough to hang your disbelief on that you could see something like this happening you know like I, I i'm digging a hole for myself here like now now I'm, I'm saying it and i'm like well you'd never believe you you'd always think it was fake i'm just saying like there's enough it's grounded just enough in reality to where it's played straight it's not played like a movie you know i guess i'm i'm making some sense but probably not but i'm just saying you look at this and you're like you know this doesn't smack of uh, Hollywood. This doesn't seem like it was scripted. I could see this, you know, these people were reacting like I would think they would react. Uh, and even some people disagreed. I was on, I'm always on team uh, uh, Mika. I'm, I'm on team Mika because nobody liked him, but I was like, I am him. Um, but uh, yeah, th and I was with it for one. I was with it for two. I thought three, three was where it started to lose me. And I like three. Um, but it got to the point where three, uh, it, it, three is based on these old VHS tapes that they found in the basement and then they were stolen all of a sudden. And then we see the movie, which is these VHS tapes. And that's always one of the biggest problems in found footage movies is who found the footage and three, there's no answer to that. Like, th okay, these VHS, VHS tapes got stolen, but one presumes it was by the the bad guys or the cultists or whatever you want to call them in three. So I'm like, how the fuck did these take? Like, who edited this footage? Who who released it in theaters? Because even Paranormal one and two, you could kind of see, like, you could kind of believe that these guys, you know, like the police or some documentarians or something like that, they got a hold of these tapes and they put them together and they're like, this is fucked up. Just watch this and. Like, this could be proof of the paranormal. Like, if you were to see that, you'd be like, wow, that's fucked up. But three, it's like, you know, like in one and two, they, they, they thank, they thank the families. They, they, they give their condolences to the families. They thank the police department for making the records available. You know, they go on and, and until the credits roll, it's, it's presented almost like a memorial to these dead people. And that's what I mean when I say, I say they play it straight. They thank the press. They thank all these. And they're like, we, we, we have nothing but the deepest sympathies for the families here. We're just trying to figure out what happened. And so that, that's where I'm coming from when I say it, it's kind of real. Third movie, they throw it out the window. They're just like, uh, yeah, there was VHS tapes. And, and for some reason, you are now seeing them. I'm like, how? who got these tapes? Where did they come from? Did the documentarians get these? But there's no... 
there's no bracketing. There's no, like, it used to be there's title cards. In fact, I don't even remember if there were title cards, like the ones that say like night one, night two, that kind of preface. There probably were, but I'm like, who, who did that? How did they get the tapes? I don't understand any of this. Um, now, just uh, as long as you're taking the ride, you're like, okay, this is interesting footage. But right there, a lot of the disbelief, it sounds silly, but the, that little thing, the little title cards, beginning and end, really help you hang your disbelief, you know. Um, and they're back here, you know. And, and it, But the, the weird thing is, it, it doesn't help anymore because things are so absurd. Things are so out of hand. Things are so fucking crazy in this movie that it goes beyond, like, it, it goes beyond... There's some unexplained, like in the first one, it goes like, you know, there's some unexplainable shit on this, on this footage and maybe you can figure it out. I don't know. And then there's this movie where it is absolutely batshit. There are people getting like, there are people getting like grabbed by the ankles and swung into walls and the ceiling. There's people getting their necks snapped like, like fucking crazy. There's like a body count of like five people in this movie and it's too much. You know, there's so much... If, if this movie were to hit theaters, and it were like a real documentary, um, there would be fucking riots, because this is like undeniable proof of the supernatural. You see fucking demons in this movie, you know, and it, that's what I mean when I say, like, you know, before it's this unseen menace, you know, you, you don't see anything. It, it could be, you know, it could be fake, but it might not be, and... You know, it's just enough weird stuff going on that you don't know. But now, there's this clearly malevolent force that is just straight up killing fuckers. You know, it's it's doing stuff like ripping chandeliers off the walls. It's like, it's, 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 it's absolutely crazy. And the worst part is it's all played like a movie. Um, the, the editing is manipulative as shit. Uh... And I'm trying to figure out where to start. I guess I'll start from the beginning. A very good place to start. Um, what happens is they uh, there's a new family, okay, and there's this uh, teenage there's this teenage girl named Alex who's like 15, who is pro by far the the strength of this movie is ironically the acting. It's very good. It's a shame the story sucks so bad, but the acting is great. Um, so she's very good. And what the, the thing happens is that uh, a new family moves in across the street. And it's it's Katie and the kid that she took from, you know, from number two. It's it's They never even make any bones about it. It's them. And the kid is acting like fucking Damien from The Omen. So much, like, it's... The kid is so fucking spooky. They might as well have just be... They might as well just literally play the music from The Omen every time that kid... Because the kid like, stands in the middle of a park, just, like, staring, and it's like, oh, yeah, this you know, this kid is, like, so clearly the devil, and even the, even the characters, it, I, I almost think the, the actors were watching the shit going on, and they're, like, even they couldn't, like, they, they must have, like, walked up to the director and be like, okay, there's no way that anyone normal would watch this kid and not be, like, seriously like like pull each other aside and be like are you fucking kidding me this kid is satan it, like it's but nobody sees it it's one of those movies where like the the two main characters are the only people who like clearly see this kid as possessed by de like fucking demons because the kid all but speaks in like fucking ancient hebrew you know it's like hey uh hey i forget his name um Robbie, they're like, hey, Robbie, you want to come play football with us? I am the vessel of the outer plane god, Azatoth. Yeah, yeah, Cthulhu Fatah, you know, like all but doing that. The kid is like, the, the, you know, her and her boyfriend, the boyfriend, by the way, best character in the movie. This kid is awesome. But like, the he, he spends the whole movie basically trying to get in her pants, you know, Alex's pants. And it's, it sounds irritating, but it's not. He's really good. And what's also funny is, you know how I was saying, like, I identified with the first movie's character, Mika, where he was, like, a complete asshole. I'd be like, he's, he's like, no, I want to get this on tape. I want to, I want to, and she's like, no, don't do it. No, I want to, I want to do it. Because, like, I said, I would totally be that guy. I, my first thought upon seeing this shit was, like, I would put it on YouTube. Um, I, I would put it on YouTube. No, that's, 
legitimately the first thing he says is like, oh, dude, I want to record this. Put it on YouTube, man. I'm like, yes. So I love that. Anyway, so he's he's trying to find excuses to go on walks with her and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, you got a, you got a playground out here, right? Well, why don't we go up to the treehouse? You know, where, where the, the little kid is. And so he goes to the treehouse. And of course, for some reason, they got a fucking camera on him. So they go up to the treehouse, and he turns around, and sure enough, like, one of the first jump scares of the movie is the kid is just standing there, like, in the corner, staring blankly ahead. Like, this kid has been there for hours. You know, dead silent, not reacting to anybody climbing. It's just like... And, of course, everyone loses their shit. They're like, oh, my God! Rob, what the fuck are you doing here? And Robbie is just like... welcome mortal you know like it like a fucking robot it's like it it's, it's almost like the the kid doesn't even move when he turns he's just like <laughs> organic life form identified you know this kid's fucking crazy right so like i forgot where i was oh the kid being clearly evil so like that's just like one example of the kid all the time being just out of his fucking gourd they and this is what the, all right, this is immediately where the movie starts falling apart. So the uh, weird shit hasn't even started happening yet. And then across the street, uh, there's ambulances in front of the in, in front of the neighbor's house where Katie is. And they're like, "Oh, Katie got sent to the hospital." So Robbie, the kid over there, has nowhere else to say because there's pardon me, there's no relatives. He's got nowhere else to go, so Robbie is going to be sleeping over with us. So, I'll just spoil it. For th this And this is one of the first things that makes no sense, is Katie gets hauled off to the hospital, so the kid has to stay over, but there's never any explanation for why Katie went to the hospital and had to stay inpatient, like, had to stay there for three or four days, you know. Um... Because hospitals won't just let you stay there, you know, and, and they even comment on this when Katie comes home from the hospital, the, the girl is like talking to her mom and she's, she says, she looked fine. Like she, she didn't look like there was any reason for being, for her to be in the hospital at all. Like there's no marks on her arms from where they might've put an IV, uh, she looks fine. And like, so the, she comments like, why did she go to the hospital? She looks like she's always been fine. And nobody has an answer for this. And I'm like, no, that's a question worth answering. Like, why did she get admitted to the hospital? And why was she why was she kept inpatient for so long? Because that strange credulity of everyone at the hospital, you know, and you never get to see what happens on her end. And it's silly. Um much less why why Robbie would stay over for so long. Why nobody? I, I don't know. So yeah, the kid the kid just acts bizarrely the whole time. Like the kid comes over and says hi to their kid, and like it's this really weird vibe between them where like he kind of shuffles over and then like holds his hand out. Like I understand this is how you mortals greet one another. Like really. It, and the, the parents are are the most maddeningly this is like where it, one of the biggest and worst cliches and i'm gonna say those words a lot one of the biggest and worst cliches in horror movies are the idiot parents you know what i'm talking about where clearly fucked up shit is happening in the house but the parents are the only ones not to see it and even when the kids try to explain to the parents that there's fucked up shit going on they either don't listen or or they conveniently interrupt the the people before they can explain or something. But they never listen. They chalk it up to their imaginations or stress or just before they're about to show them what's going on, something else happens and they get pulled away. Like the phone rings and the, the kids are like, damn it, I was going to tell them too. This is that turned up to 11. These are the dumbest parents. Okay, maybe not... The, I could probably come up with an example and give it an hour to think, but these are among the top two dumbest parents I've ever seen in a movie. Because even when 
clearly supernatural shit is happening to them. The dad in particular, they're just like, oh, you're overstressed. You're just, you, you're just, school is, you know, you're just a man, you're not getting enough sleep, so you're seeing weird shit. I know you don't like the kid, but there's no reason to make this shit up. <sighs> okay, first off, maybe this is me. But if my kid came up to me and looked legit worried, and she, by the way, she's 15, like maybe a little kid might be making up an imaginary friend or noises that, you know, something goes bump in the night and the kid's like eight, I'd be like, look, you're seriously like, just go to sleep. But when you get to 15 and she's like, dude, I saw a shadowy fucking figure in my closet or there is clearly something weird going on in this house, I'd look into it. You know, I wouldn't just, oh, it's stress. You don't like school. This kid is creeping you out. And it, it is, so like, even if you were to give them that, even if you were to give them like, maybe she had attitude problems. She's done this before. She hasn't. But let's just say like, worst case scenario, she's done this shit before. No, because there comes a point when the mom is like chopping vegetables and she turns her back and all of a sudden the knife like flies up out of camera shot and just stays there. Um, which is actually one of the better scares in the movie because you're like, when is this knife going to drop? Is it going to like fucking impale someone or stick in their head? And it doesn't like not right away. And honestly, they should have, they should have held off on that longer. Cause that's what I'm saying when it comes to jump scares, you, it, I, I forget who said it, but there's, th there's like this example of, uh, it might've been Hitchcock, but there's like, there's, there's a bomb under a table and two people are sitting at the table, and real suspense is the bomb doesn't go off. So you're wondering when the bomb is going to go off. I'm, I'm bastardizing that quote completely, but that's what I mean. Is So, like, they could have held that knife up there for the better part of an hour, and that still would have been scary, because you're waiting for that knife to drop. And when the knife drops, it will be a jump scare, but it's earned, because you're waiting. You're not afraid of the noise, you're afraid of when that knife is going to drop because you know it's coming. And every time you get to that shot, you know, like, is this the, is this the scene? Uh, damn it. And, like, the scene passes and you're like, no, that's not the... So it's got to come... It's going to come eventually. God, when is it going to happen? So, like, eventually the dad comes into the kitchen. It's late at night. He's hearing weird shit. He's fucking around. And all of a sudden, like, right in front of him, the knife goes, bam! The knife just... Brrr, you know, like right where his hand was and it's like vibrating there and the dad's like, and you're like, oh my God, you know, that, that almost killed him. And so like, he, he's looking, he's like, where the fuck did that knife come from? And then he's, 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 he's legit freaked out and he's like, he starts to like tug on the knife, but the fucking knife is sunk into the counter like two inches, like clearly something like something weird, like fucking bam. Like, buried that fucking knife in the counter. So he, like, has to, like, post down on the counter and, like, rip this thing out. I know, Oreo, it's scary. So he has to rip this knife out of the table. There is no rational explanation for this happening. You know, this is not like, like, how did the knife get up there? There's, like, even, there's nobody around that could have, like, rammed the knife into the counter. There's no reasonable explanation for the knife, like, hanging up there. And, like, what, what happened? Did, did the mom, like put a thing a fishing line up there and hang it with a tack or in it there's no reason for that and so like after that scene after that scene he's just like nothing happened nothing and when scary shit keeps happening to the girl and she comes running and screaming to her dad like oh my god something locked me in the garage and it started the car and it tried to kill me with carbon monoxide fumes this happens by the way she's like oh my god oh my god so i had to escape and the only way i could think to escape because the doors wouldn't open was to jump in the car and throw it into reverse and crash through the garage door and of course before she can explain anything before she can say she's like i got locked in the garage and before she can get to like and something was trying to kill me i couldn't open the doors and I had to get in the car. Before she... The dad is like, okay, okay, calm down. You've been going on about this. But you don't understand. Something held the doors late and it tried to kill me. There was karma. He's, she's like, look, 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 look. Listen, I know the kid is freaking you out, but there's no reason to do this. Like, why would you drive the... She's like, yeah, but I had to because I was getting... No, no, honey, honey, please. Just go to bed. We're going to talk about this later. You just want to grab this guy by his fucking shirt. 
bitch slap him twice, three times across. Would you listen, please? Like, there's no reason she wouldn't just scream at it. Like, shut up! No reason. Completely out of his fucking mind. And this is not... Like, there's no reason why he wouldn't just shut up and listen to her. Because she's clearly upset. There has to... This is not like a teen misbehaving. Why would she ever drive the car through the garage door unless there was a legitimate life and fucking death reason? Maybe... They, they could have maybe given some plausible... Like, like, at some point established, like... You know you're not supposed to borrow the car. You don't have a license. But still, come on. Like, that would have been the weakest justification ever. Like, in fact, you would have thought the dad would sit down and wait for a real good goddamn explanation for why the garage door is obliterated. But she's like, she's like, he's like, no, no, honey, go to bed. Go, would you please? Like, I don't want to hear any of your more ghosts, any more of your stories. Would you please? Why does he keep interrupting her? This makes no fucking sense. Especially since she has it on tape. Like, even if he didn't believe any of these ghost stories, which he should, considering a fucking knife dropped from the ceiling and embedded itself two inches in the fucking Formica. Like, don't you think he would maybe have, like, even the slightest interest in these ghost stories that she's been talking about, especially since something completely unexplainable happened to him the night before? Like, how dense is this motherfucker? It's it's so ridiculous that there's no real character on the planet who would, who would not stop and listen to this. Like, at least listen to the explanation, even if he thought it was ridiculous. Especially since she has a recording of it. All she had to do is be like, would you just wait? I'm going to call this guy over who can get the footage and he will show you. There's no explanation. And that's what I mean when I say this story is just like, these people are like Martians. They're completely unrelatable, you know? And this is, this movie is where, uh, the 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 omnipresent recording just completely fails like they actually came up with really good explanations for why the camera has been set up in various rooms in all three of the movies beforehand the third one it was the weakest but they're like okay the first one weird shit is going down and the guy really wants to record it because he's just interested and you're like okay i buy that the second movie someone broke into their house and trashed the place so they install a really super fly high-tech surveillance system and the surveillance system is what catches the shit the third one is basically the same thing the guy is like man there's weird shit going on i saw something in my house so i want to get this because it's fucked up i want to get this the fourth the fourth movie is some weird shit's going on and it's actually a logical progression because in modern day we have cameras everywhere we have them in our laptops we have them in our ipads we have them in our cell phones for christ's sake we have cameras in everything so it makes sense that we have almost omnipresent recording devices at our disposal but even here they push it way too far because she goes um she she goes on on basically skype web chat with her boyfriend a lot which is also kind of strange considering he drives over all the time, but whatever. So it turns out that he's actually been recording her Skype calls, which for some reason she keeps open and running all night long before she knows anything weird is happening. She keeps this like, and she's like, why would you record our Skype chat calls? Like you were watching me sleep. And he's like, no, well, yeah, but that's not the point. And I'm like, why would she leave the fucking chat open when she's sleeping? She, cause she does. And th- I almost, this, this sounds rapey, but like, why would she leave the chat open? Like maybe she forgot, but even like, that's not the sort of thing you would forget because your laptop is open and fucking glowing at night. And it doesn't make any sense. And plus, this guy, by the way, fucking creepy, recording her sleep. Yeah. Anyway, so he's like, that's not the point. I'm like, it is? And he's like, no, no, no. Um, he's like, point is, something weird happened when you were sleeping. And she's like, 
okay, fucking show me. So he scales up, and sure enough, the creepy kid, like, stands in her doorway for hours and then climbs into bed with her and starts, like, feeling her. And right there, like, she goes to her parents and, like, dude, the creepy kid, the creepy kid came into my room and started, like, grabbing my titties and stuff like that. And the parents, of course, are like, yeah, well... Look, the kid is disturbed. He just saw his mother got loaded into an ambulance. He's going to be stressed. He's going to want company when he sleeps. And I'm like, you got to talk to this kid and be like, Robbie, you can't go climbing into people's beds. It's fucking scary and creepy. Like, just stay in your own room, okay? They never do this. Um, And they use that excuse. Look, Robbie just saw his mom get taken off in an ambulance. He's scared. They do that like four times in this movie. Of course, completely disregarding the compl- you know, legitimate concerns of the kid, which she has on tape. Because like several times during the course of these nights, the kid fucking gets out of his bed and starts staring at the blank wall, talking to the demon. All but, again, all but speaking to this demon in fucking, in fucking Babylonian. You know, like, uh, insane, really creepy shit. Like... Yes, they're asleep, my lord and master. They are completely oblivious to your greatness. Soon, the eighth, the eighth portal to hell will open and you will come and subjugate these feeble mortals sitting on a throne of blood. Like, this fucking shit happens. She has it on tape, or she has it recorded, and she doesn't show them. She doesn't show them, because I guess I wouldn't show them either, because they'd be like, oh, he's fucking scared. Her mother just got loaded into an ambulance. We all talk to imaginary demons when we see that. I did. Back to the recording, where this thing completely falls apart. So, this weird shit keeps happening. She sees it happening on the recorded hard drive, and she's like, shit. This weird stuff is happening all over the house. So, can you set up... I know, it was a scary movie. She's like, can you set up, set it up so every laptop in the house records continuously because I need to see this? And I'm like, no. Don't believe it. Because not only... Like, conveniently, there are like five laptops in the house. And really good ones. They even throw... They have a throwaway line in there to explain why there's really good laptops all over the house. There's one in her room. There's one in the kids' room. And they're like, why is why did the kids have such a good laptop? And she's like, she's like, oh well, when I got a new one, I had a really good one before, and so they got my hand me down. There's a laptop in the kitchen because the mom likes to have a laptop open so she can look at recipes. I'm like, no. There's there's a camera. I don't even know where this fucking camera comes from, but in the uh, in the like the living room where the video game system is, there's a laptop set up there. And, like, th- there's, like, five cameras, and not counting the cell phone camera, the the laptop that she brings with her that has the Skype chat, and the actual camera camera that the boyfriend carries around. And I'm like, no, this this is dumb. And if you've ever used a computer in your life, you would know how silly this is, because let's say you had a camera rolling all day, every day, and all night, every night, just try to do the, just even the loosest math. Try to figure out how big those fucking video files would be, even rendered in low quality. And this is taking place over the course of like 20 days. Okay, maybe 15, but even so. Low qu- There's like no fucking, uh, no fucking uh, Apple laptop is going to hold that much footage. Ever. It just does not happen. And especially, this is high quality footage as well. So, like, we're not dealing with low res footage. We're dealing with, like, you know, movie quality shit. So, goddamn, I can't record off my desktop for more than an hour and not rack up, like, 30 gigs of fucking video files. Like, no way does this happen. So, right away, completely unbelievable. Not only that, like, there's, like, two cameras in the house that can record infrared. I actually priced out a camera that can record infrared. It was like the cheapest one I could find was $1,100. And I'm like, no way is there, there's no laptop that I can think of that has an infrared camera. Second, 
to even have a handheld DV can that has infrared, no fucking way Robbie dropped $1,100, $1,200 on this fucking thing. And there's just no way, you know. And there's, by the way, no video camera around is going to hold 24 hours of footage. Like, I could probably run mine on the lowest quality for, like, on the outside, eight. You know. So unless he was running in every eight hours to change cards, not buying it. And again, uh, even in number three, that really stretched because the most you can get out of a uh, VHS tape is six hours if you have it on the lowest quality. So I, I think they actually did establish that he was legit every six hours changing the tapes. But uh, there's also this weird thing, and I have no idea if this is true or not. It probably is. But they get so much mileage out of the, uh, apparently the Connect shoots out like thousands and thousands of infrared beams that make like this uh, little points, almost like a planetarium, these little points all over the place that you can see if the lights are off and you have an infrared camera. So it's a really cool looking effect and they, they do it like every night to catch the ghosts like walking around. I know, it's fucking spooky. So, you know, the, the, it, it, if it's really true, I should see if I, I don't have an infrared camera, I can't afford one, you know. Um, I actually have one on my wish list. I'm like, I will, I am never going to buy this because when will I ever use it? So like, you have to wonder why this kid is like, I need an infrared camera because I need to watch my girlfriend sleep or some shit. I don't know. So, um, yeah, it, it's the, the, it's completely unbelievable. Um, oh, the demon, this demon is so fucking weird now. It, it's motivations are completely out. Um, for some reason, the the demon has has consistently been shown that it's able to disrupt electronics because the camera will start to fail like in in the previous movies the camera will fail the tv will start going to static the lights will flicker on and off and and yet when this happens in the house in this movie the laptops stay on the laptops keep recording and i'm like well why did the lights go out and the laptop stayed on and you're like well maybe the demon wanted to be seen no it doesn't because Weird shit starts happening, and the kid goes into a room, you know, like, a fucking chandelier falls, and the kid is like, Toby doesn't like you watching us, and then runs off, you know? And I'm like, well, if Toby doesn't like you watching them, why doesn't Toby take his fucking ethereal hand and close the laptops? Why doesn't Toby, like, grab up the camera that's watching him at all times and smash it against a fucking wall? There's no reason why it wouldn't if Toby don't like being watched. And it's like it's not like Toby has anything to fear, which leads me to my next point. Why is Toby just straight up fucking around with the people now? Like in the earlier movies, you can kind of buy it because the the go I, like I justify it to myself anyway by saying, okay, there's a demon around, but it's not like fully into this world. It can't really interact directly with the with the with the real world because maybe it can only do it for a few seconds at a time it's maybe trying to freak them out to lower their resistances or it can only have a legitimate connection to this world if it possesses somebody so like maybe it can't interact with everything that much it can only interact for any long period of time if it possesses somebody which is why it possesses katie you know so like that's kind of the, the I, I i dug that in the first three movies the demon doesn't really have that much of a physical presence, so it can only kind of fuck around with things. Like, it can slam doors, it can lure people to where it, it has, you know, it can lure people around so it can ambush them, because it doesn't have that much strength or something. That's how I justified it to myself, and it made sense that way. In this movie, we have long ago established that Katie has been absolutely and uncontrollably possessed by this demon because twice now we have seen katie just outright straight up thug thug fuck up people like when she fucking hurled mika across the room ass first into the camera when we saw katie fucking show the uh the girl from the second movie like right through the fucking ceiling you're like jesus christ this demon has made her like some kind of fucking wonder woman so like why? Oh, I, I got to backpedal a little bit. This, oh, th this is another thing that fucking just infuriated me. Okay, in the second movie, it's established that there's this, the whole witchcraft thing. Um, what the demon ultimately wants is the firstborn male child of the family because there's some kind of deal with Satan that kind of went on. So the demon wants the first male born child and the kid's name is Hunter. 
Okay, so the entire second movie, the demon is trying to get a hold of Hunter, and it ends with Katie doing the show where you can and taking the kid and leaving. You know, so okay, so the Katie has Hunter walks off, and you're like, wow, why is Katie now fucking with this new family in the fourth movie? This is where I almost walked out of the theater. I I was so mad. Okay, here's what happens. It okay big spoilers not even that huge a spoiler but whatever what it turns out that the kid that katie got was not hunter it turns out that hunter is the adopted child in the new family in four apparently katie got the wrong kid this movie took the entire concept of the second movie and punted. It punted to a fifth movie. Blatantly and inexcusably, it essentially retconned Paranormal Activity 2 by saying, oh, all that shit that happened in 2, completely pointless because that wasn't the actual kid. No, this is the kid here. And there's so many plot holes that that opens. And maybe I just was so mad I wasn't paying attention i i don't think that's the case but maybe i just missed the part that explained every single plot hole that raises why why in the name of fucking christ why would the original family give up hunter for adoption why it doesn't make any sense considering they have a kid and that kid is named hunter did like did they did that family have a kid and not like the kid and take it back to the hospital and they're like this kid is defective can we trade it in for a new one and they handed it what, what the fuck that doesn't make any fucking sense and then like why if if the family in the fourth movie had a kid they had Alex why would they feel compelled to adopt when it's been shown that they could have kids? Did something happen? Which is never explained? Did, why? And why, in this movie, if they only have one little kid, do they have bunk beds? And this isn't the sort of thing where, like, oh, maybe, maybe the girl and, um, <sighs> Oreo... It's not the sort of thing where, like, maybe Alex and the kid were little kids at the same time, so they slept in bunk beds. There's no way, because, like, like Wyatt is, like, fucking seven. So there's no reason they would have bunk beds. And this is the sort of thing I nitpick about, like, crazy. But there's there's no reason for it. it, it they only have bunk beds because they can't, they don't have two beds in the I, I why would they give the kid up for adoption and still have a kid? Why would they? Why would the other family adopt a kid if they already had a kid? It doesn't make any fucking sense. And it so pisses me off that, like, why would the demon even stalk the second family if Hunter was not in that family? Like, did the family know about this and try to psych out the demon with a fake Hunter? Like, did they give the original Hunter for adoption, then they adopt another kid and named it Hunter so the demon wouldn't know? I don't think so, because in the second movie, nobody in the family knows that there's a demon after them. I don't understand any of this. And it's so needlessly complicated. This movie should have wrapped up with the... It should have wrapped up with the third, but it should have definitely wrapped up with the fourth, where there's finally some kind of answer, some kind of confrontation. But no... It, like, it punts. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. We gotta, the real Hunter is, is abducted in this movie, and then in the fifth movie, we're gonna show you what the fuck happened. You can't punt. <laughs> it's like fourth down in this movie, and they punt. It's so fucking stupid. I get worked up. I'm gonna get a fucking ulcer watching these goddamn movies. <sighs> okay. The jump scares. This movie is almost all jump scares. Whereas in the first movie, whereas in all the movies previous to this, the jump scares were restrained. There were only a few. They... And... 
there were only a few, okay? And I know that's hypocritical of me to say because almost all the paranormal movies are kind of based on the jump scare. But to me, it was much more restrained. It still looked kind of real. Um, and it had legitimacy because, again, this sounds stupid, but there were no loud orchestra stings. You know, to me, the loud orchestra sting is, is the yelling in the ear of these movies. They didn't have that. And I really thought the jump scares in this movie, in that movie were earned three, a little too much, but whatever. In the fourth movie, there are so many fucking jump scares and they are the most predictable cliche jump scares. For instance, they like, she goes downstairs and she sees a chandelier swinging and you're like, okay, they're distracting us with that one chandelier. They're drawing your eye over here so another chandelier can fall. I'm like, sure enough, a chandelier falls. And almost like right on cue. I can call this shit. Um, you know, it, it's... And it's basically because we've kind of sussed out the paranormal activity formula where it draws your eye over here and then something flies out over here. It, we've seen this trick like three movies already. We can kind of call it. And you do. You call virtually every single scare. There's a few ones that are really, really good. Like when they turn around in the treehouse and they see the kids stand there like fucking Blair Witch. Good one. There's a few really good ones. But there's a lot of really bad ones. And they do the most cliche... This is the second time I do it. The most cliched, hackneyed, jump scare of them all. Cat. They do the cat scare. And they do the cat scare twice. Fucking twice. The cat leaps out and scares them. I'm like, fuck you. Fuck you with your jump scare bullshit. They actually do the cat. Virtually none of the characters are likable. Um, you know, the second family was really good. They had the dog... And you're like, you're actually really invested in the dog's fate. Uh, it, it's ironic that the two characters you care about are the are the the boyfriend and girlfriend characters. Because the boyfriend, like I said, is really great. Oreo is squeaking on a toy because I'm not paying attention to her. So, where the fuck was I? Um, yeah, they do a lot with the connect. And I guess I'll wrap up. I'm, I'm just rambling about the fucking jump scares. Oh, another thing that really really fucking detracts from the, the the legitimacy of this movie where you just completely stop buying that it's real is they do like they they actually start to reference several other horror movies and when you do that it takes you right out of it right out of it for instance there's a scene with a basketball bouncing down the stairs and all of a sudden stopping because that's what the demon would do the demon would fucking dribble down a set of stairs and then stop. Ooh. That really plays into the demon's diabolical plan. And there's another one where the kid, like one of the kids, is like pedaling around the house on this little like recumbent tricycle. Which is exactly the thing that happens in The Shining. When the kid is like pedaling down the halls on this tricycle thing. And I'm like, you know, I'm not fucking stupid. I know where this comes from. And you're just reminding me at, at every turn this is a fucking movie. It's not at, like, there's no way I can possibly buy this is found footage anymore. Um, this is the squeaky toy and Oreo. Is, this is the scariest thing in this movie. Um, the ending is where, the ending, fucking silly. The ending has always been the weak point of all the movies, I think. Um, where where that's that's where like the really fucking scary shit happens and that's usually where the the really indefensible cinematic crap happens with like the demon face in the first one uh pretty much the demon face in all of them you know um in this one the ending just goes absolutely out of its mind where um it, like i said uh it finally reaches a point oh oh i remember i okay my tangent uh i was going on about why the uh why if if the demon was weaker before until it possessed katie it has now possessed katie in the fourth movie we have established that katie is like this superhuman possessed entity that can show why you can use so hard it fucking kills you okay this has been established why in the fourth movie 
if if Katie wants this kid, why does she not immediately, like from frame one, fucking pump kick the door open and start snapping necks like Steven Seagal? There's no reason why she wouldn't. From from fucking frame one. Like, if she wants this kid, she could go in there. She's fucking invulnerable. She would, and even if she's not, like, if she could be legit killed, she would take this family so by surprise, There's, it's clear they're not armed in any way. She could walk in there and just fucking brutalize this entire family, and there's no reason why she couldn't. And ironically enough, at the uh, at in the third act, that's exactly what she does. She just... She essentially just walks in the house and fucking murders everybody. And I'm like, okay, what took you so long? Why would you do this thing where fucking Toby is like dribbling basketballs, playing Connect late at night? And they, they try to explain it where like, oh, they have to make they have to make Hunter ready for his possession, for his for his final absorption into the cult. And like, well, why doesn't why doesn't Katie just kill everybody, abduct the kid? And then indoctrinate him into the family over there. Like, why doesn't she just kill everybody, pile them into a car, and move somewhere else where she could have full 24-7 access to them? And it makes no sense. So I was actually really happy when Katie just was like, fuck it, I'm, I'm a fucking demon, and starts killing everybody. And so, what is the fucking dumbest thing that the, the kid can do when this starts happening? She goes, like, she's out of the house when all this happens, okay? And so she's like... She comes home and she finds her boyfriend with his head fucking twisted around. And so she's like, oh my god! Oh my god! Hunter's been kidnapped! So she goes out and she sees Katie walking into this this house, or her house across the street. And so, what's the dumbest thing she could possibly do? Instead of calling the cops? No. She chases Katie across the goddamn street and runs into their house. And she dies! big shock because when she gets into the house katie goes full fucking demon on her and kills her da 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 like how fucking dumb are you girl call the cops ninjas tv demons cops and i'm not saying like like oh no she went she had to get hunter right away because like she didn't have time to off bullshit what's she gonna do she's 15 years old what's she gonna You've seen her boyfriend with her with his head fucking twisted. Her. What are you gonna do? Because you've seen this, you've seen this fucking demon like throw shit all over the place. Your parents are fucking dead. Um, like, what are you gonna do? You call the cops. You get him out of here. She's not going anywhere. She's in the house. And even if she piles in the car, you can find her. The cops are very good at finding people with a helicopter. It works out great. So, goddamn, retard... And this is, like, she has, even when she goes in, she sees her dad being, like, run through the house by this invisible fucking force. Like, being ping-ponged across the walls. Like, this demon is just slamming him left and right. And eventually, like, fucking kills him and they disappear into this room, right? And, like, even then, like, she has a chance to get out of there. There's no fucking... Re- like, she might... She, she has to realize, like, Oh my god, I stand no chance against this bullshit. Unless I have a cross-soaked in olive oil. First movie. Psst, bullshit. And where it gets... I keep saying this, too. Oreo, go get your... Sweet. And the worst part of this scene is she tapes it. Or she records it. How? She has her camera phone out. And even when her parents are getting murdered in front of her face... She has her camera phone out, and she runs through the house, and even when Katie fucking goes demon face on her, camera's still out. She's in mortal fucking danger. See, she's smashing a window to get out of this house. Camera phone in her left hand. The first question, the second question, the first question you have to ask in a found footage movie is why are they taping it? The second question is, how are they taping it? The third question is, when the shit starts to go down, why don't they put the camera down? You ha- I, st- I actually started writing a screenplay. And before I realized how cliche this whole thing has become, I started it out as a found footage movie. It is no longer a found footage movie, this thing I'm writing. And the reason is, when people start to die, cameras are off. You know, 
when it, it it depends a little bit but like when people start to legit die like straight up just get murdered like steven seagal neck snapping or like people are in are in danger knives start getting thrown around the cameras are uh, the camera should go off the police really should be contacted or somebody needs to be called in on this shit because this is fucking insane so like i can appreciate her wanting to document this but when the parents are getting killed right in front of her you throw the camera down you call the cops you know so in the screenplay i was writing same problem think shit got shit starts getting real and this is even a case where they really would keep the cameras rolling because in this movie it's like a it's like a a laboratory experiment it's they're they're doing an experiment and it's important they tape them 24 7 but when people start dying it's time to call the cops you know the, the the experiment is over you know you would not keep taping this unless it was for legal purposes but the like i said people are dying it's over you know there's no reason you wouldn't drop the phone and not only does she not drop the phone it's perfectly stable it's on like a fucking steady cam she has all the shots perfectly framed at all times even when like the fucking demons have surrounded her there's more than one now in fact there's like a fucking thousand of them but whatever that last shot in the movie is really weird but like at no like you throw the fucking oh there's another one this was hilarious to me okay she's in the garage and the demon traps her in the garage it fucking slams the garage door shut it somehow holds the other garage door shut that leads back into the house it turns the car on and starts to fill the room with carbon monoxide okay and you're like so she's in big trouble and the reason there's a camera on her is because she's she's on a video chat with her boyfriend and she's carrying the laptop around okay fair enough so when the room starts filling up with the carbon monoxide she puts the camera she puts the laptop on the floor i'm like okay then she starts to try the door doors the door is closed so then she's like i gotta get in the car so she runs past the laptop and on her way past the laptop she spins it around she spins the whole laptop around to look at the car I laughed so hard at that. Bullshit. Fucking bullshit. I I was like, she's in mortal danger. She's trapped in a room that's filling with poison gas. She turns the laptop around to look at her. Oh my god, have you spent the last shred of suspension of disbelief this movie series ever had. Wow. So dumb. So amazingly dumb. This is what I'm talking about when I say it's there's no way you can believe this. There's none. It, it it's a straight up slasher movie. It, it's it's a slasher movie from this point on, and maybe you're okay with that. But the thing is, that the formula established in the Paranormal Activity movies only works so long as you believe it's found footage. It is no longer found footage, and I this is the last real problem I have with the movie. I will stop here on this movie, but the reason I say, even if you were to buy that they recorded all this shit let's just say they recorded all this shit and for some reason conveniently she spins the laptop around as she's dying she she still has her camera phone in her hand even if you believe that happened once again the question is raised who got this footage and who edited it okay the first question all this shit's been recorded on apparently her infinite laptop storage space but let's say the documentarians got a hold of this did they also edit this? Because why would they edit it like a horror movie? Here's how. Here's what I mean. First movie, second movie, even the third movie. When weird shit starts happening, like really weird shit, when people start getting sucked out of their beds or sheets start getting thrown around or things start collapsing, you know, when things are going on, you see it. 
and I know that sounds weird. You actually see everything that happens. In this movie, this is the best example I can think of. In this movie, the demon actually like walks into her room and she's in bed, okay? Alex is in bed. What happens is, like Zool in fucking Ghostbusters, she starts to like float over her bed like some unseen arms are picking her up. And she's like suspended three feet over her bed. So she's being held there over her bed like something is about to like snap her in half. She's floating there. And then we cut to the... Then we cut. Just like, bam. We cut to the living room where the connect is set up. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're cutting? You're doing an edit. In the middle of the girl floating above her bed. What, did you think that wasn't interesting enough? We have to cut to the fucking connect? We have to cut to the fucking living room where nothing is happening? Did you, did you think we'd get bored? Like, if this were real, would you not think that we would want to see the evidence of the paranormal of this girl somehow floating over her fucking bed? Why would you edit it may, and they do this several fucking times. We're like, like, you know, there's a kid in a pool. The, the kid is taking a bath. And this, by the way, raises so many weird questions about the ethicality this girl has of recording her family 24-7, including the potential for watching the little children undress. Anyway, this is another jump scare that's completely telegraphed because the kid's sitting in a, in a bathtub. You're like, he's going to get sucked under the water. He's going to get sucked. Yep, there it goes. He's sucked under the water. This is another huge plot hole. The mom is giving the kid a bath. So in the middle of the bath, she's like, wait a minute. I need to go downstairs and get something. Bullshit. Bullshit. Like, unless this mom is the worst mom ever, you never leave a kid as young as that in a pool or a bathtub alone. Never, 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 ever. My mom didn't leave me in any sizable body of water until I was like fucking 16. Now, was it, was it, uh, was it too much? Yeah. You know, it was, it was over much that, but she wanted me safe. If I was fucking six, no, I was never alone in the pool. I was never alone. Uh, I mean, uh, I was never alone in the pool. I, I can't... I, I was taking my own baths, I think, but, like, she would check up on, like... I, I don't even remember, but my point is, like, there. if she was giving him a bath, okay, if she was doing that, she should never leave the kid alone. It would never happen. I'm... God damn. Never ha I can't even remember if my mom was giving me baths at that age, but if she were, No. In fact, given how paranoid she was about me draining, she probably did. But, you know, at some point I started taking showers, you know. And, you know, honestly, I, yeah, actually, I think I think by that age I might have actually been taking showers. I wasn't taking baths. But, like, shower, she'd let me go, you know. But, yeah, if there was a bath, any kind of size, well, no, no, no. But, um, where was I with this? Uh, <laughs> I keep going on tangents. Oh, the editing. So, like, the kid gets sucked under the water he's not like whatever it is is not letting him surface he's down there for 20 seconds 30 seconds 40 seconds but before we get to 40 seconds uh, actually like at 20 seconds we cut we cut down to the kitchen where we see the mom like getting a sandwich and i'm like okay they're establishing that the mom is nowhere to be seen we cut back to the to the bathtub it's like 30 seconds now. Then we cut back to the kitchen where she's still making a fucking sandwich. I'm like, you know what? Point made. She's she's a bad mom and she's making a fucking sandwich. But, like, why would we not stick with the paranormal? Why would we not watch the paranormal activity that's going on? And this happens, like, virtually every fucking time we see anything weird happen in this house. In the middle of it, we cut. Not only that, sometimes we don't even go back to it. There, this is a perfect example. She, Alex is floating over her bed. We cut to the family room 
where nothing is happening. And then we cut to the next morning. We cut to the next morning where Alex is once again laying in her bed. What the fuck? Did you not think we'd be interested to see how she got down? Like, okay, I know it's implied she gets down, but this is paranormal activity. We would like to maybe see the paranormal activity this movie speaks of. In the first movie, in all the movies previously, we see it. Like, if Katie got sucked out of the bed, we see where she gets sucked off to. That came out weird. We see where she gets pulled to. We see Mika... Like, grab her and pull her back. We see the paranormal shit happening. I don't know why the fuck you would... The only reason you would edit it is to make it, like... Is to make it a horror movie. Where it's completely artificial now. So, that's where I'm coming from. Like, as soon as I say there's any artifice going on with these movies... Movie's out the window. Movie is done. There's no... Why would you ever watch this? Because it's boring, it's slow. It's it's completely predictable. And there's no believing it. There's no way to believe any of it there's no way to it's over it's over the series is over so the the series is once and firmly dead now the the few days before that i saw sinister okay sinister i hated now i'm seeing it in a whole different light the reason this i don't even know where to start what is up with these movies with the dumb fucking white people in it. Man, this is not a good week for white people. The, the white people in these movies is fucking stupid. We have the white family in Paranormal Activity 4 who are just like fingers in their ears, la 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 la, ghosts, yeah sure, whatever, la la la. And then we have the guys in Sinister. This will actually probably be, yeah... No, you know what? The movie is so fucking predictable. This isn't even spoilers. The family in... The whole story in Sinister is that it's about a true crime novelist played by Ethan Hawke, I believe. He writes true crime novels, but he hasn't written a good one in 10 years. He used to be a really good true crime writer, and he's he's looking for his big break again. Okay, so... It's actually an interesting character we've developed here. And character is not the problem. It's well acted and the characters are unlikable, but still kind of compelling. You know, because the guy, Ethan Hawke's character is no longer, he doesn't really care about the people as much as he used to. He's he's really just in it for the money. But, okay, here we go. He, he's in it for the money now. He's really trying to find his big break, and he'll kind of step on anyone to get it. Not exactly the most likable character traits, and yet there's there's still something in him that that cares. You know what I mean? Um, so, or uh, you are killing my horror movie vibe. She sulks. Okay, so what happens is he's he's a uh, he has moved the family from their old house to this new house because there's the case of a multiple homicide but the the weirdness is the entire family got killed except for one of the children okay so he's investigating this because he thinks there's a story in it and there is so he's not welcome in the town because it, they think it's really distasteful that he's coming and kind of investigating a case that they widely regard as closed they've basically written off the kid as being dead so he's like, I don't believe that. I believe the kid is here to be found somewhere. And so they're like, yeah, whatever. But here's the funky thing. Right away, this movie makes no sense. Because not only has he moved to the town where the disappearance happened, which he didn't have to do. There's no way you can explain to me he had to move to that town. But not only has he done that, he has moved into the exact same house as the murdered family. <laughs> exact same house completely unnecessary and you're like well no he wanted to he wanted to do full diligence to investigate this homicide he's he really wants to solve it so he's he has to go into this house okay he has to go into the house that doesn't mean he has to fucking buy it there's nobody living in the house until he buys it so why can't he just why does he have to relocate the whole fucking family? Because 
like I can see him not wanting to be apart a from his family because he's got kids. His wife is his wife is a fucking harpy who's like, you need to spend more time with the kids. But it's clear he doesn't really care about that because he's not a very likable character. Um, but there's no reason, there's no fucking reason why he couldn't say, you know what, I'm going to take a week, go to that town, get a hotel room, and I'm going to investigate this on my own. Okay? There's no reason why he couldn't do that. The house is empty. He could just go to the house, look around, get all the answers he needs to. Because really, what's he going to find in that fucking house? You know, what could possibly be there that he needs to live in that house to find? Like, I know it would be trespassing, maybe. Like, the house is still for sale in my scenario. But he could go around there and he could snoop around. He could break into that house if he really... There's nobody there. Right? There's nobody in that house. He could poke around the backyard. You know, I would really... It's been years since the disappearance. I should have put her... My identity disc. It's been years since the murder happened, so I doubt... The cops are going to come swinging around any time to chase him off. In fact, the cops seem pretty clear that they would stay away from this place because they're kind of spooked by it. Even worst case scenario, he could go to maybe the real estate agent and say like, look, I'm a novelist. I'm a true crime uh, biographer or whatever like that. And it would really mean a lot to me. Like, ask permission to poke around the house. They would probably let him. Or he could be like, um, and this wouldn't exactly give him a lot of time, but like, could I maybe like, he could lie and say like, could I get a walkthrough of the house and inspect it and see if he can find anything weird about the house during his walkthrough. And if nothing else, like, you know what I mean? He doesn't need to move in the house. Why would he ever want to do that? I, I don't understand. And he's like, well, he's like, well, no, it makes sense for me to move in the house because when I write my book, it'll be my big break. I'll have all the money I ever wanted. And I'm like, it's you don't you don't need to move in the house, bro. Get a hotel, go there, snoop around. A week later, you should have all the answers you fucking need. Because not only is it not only is it unlikely that he'll find the answers he's looking for walking around an empty house, but he probably won't. And so he does, but only because there's something supernatural involved. You know, um, I, I just it. Right away, I didn't identify with this movie because I'm like, there's no reason. He... Okay, I'm repeating myself. But like, okay, so he, he's looking around the house and spooky shit starts to happen right away. And he, sh he hears shit in the attic. And of course, when he hears shit in the attic, it's a jump scare. It's like this, it's like an anvil fucking hitting the fucking roof, you know, or the attic. And he like, he's like, oh shit, I got to investigate. And he goes up there and he finds this big fuck off scorpion there and he kills it. And he sees it's right next to this box of Super 8 film. And the Super 8 film is is labeled these really creepy titles. And the, basically the first half of the movie is him opening these Super 8 films and watching them. And sure enough, this is, this is the legit creepy stuff. Is he watches the films and they're all of different multiple serial murders. Of these families getting killed off in horrible gruesome awful disgusting ways like one family gets set on fucking fire another family gets hung or hanged like that's that's always that's, that's always been weird to me the the actual words when you're hung on a noose it's hanged or whatever um this entire family gets hanged uh another family gets fucking taped to chaise lounges and drowned in a pool and you're like oh my god this is fucking horrifying and that's the scary part of this movie. Why is it scary? Because it sets an atmosphere. It sets a tone of dread. And what's really scary about it is that, aside from the musical score, which I actually thought did detract from the fright of it, but I'll get to that, it takes place in silence. You don't hear a thing from these films. These acts of horrible violence are taking place with no sound. The only sound you hear is the rattling of the projector. That is so fucking spooky. 
that you don't hear what's going on in these murders. It's so much scarier than if you actually heard what was happening. It's hard to explain why, but it's unsettling. The fact that you are a distant observer, it, it distances you from this film, and yet you're watching these awful things happen. You're imagining, that's where horror lies, is the imagination. Uh, it, 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 you know how people often say, show, don't tell? You're being shown these things, but there's a lot that's unseen, that's left to the imagination. The horrible smell, the fear, the sound of what's going on in these houses that you're denied, that you're imagining. That's the scary part of this movie, and that's the part that's done masterfully well. Absolutely masterfully done. That's the great part of this movie. And then they fuck it up. How do they fuck it up? It's because weird shit starts happening to Ethan Hawke. And all of that weird shit is nothing but obscenely loud jump scares. All of it. And it pisses me off. Because, like, he'll be walking around, he hears shit in the attic, and sure enough, the reason he goes to investigate the attic is because he hears this gigantic fucking thundering crash, like, right over his head. It scares the shit out of you. No, it doesn't scare you. It startles the shit out of you. And, like, right away I'm like, oh, this is how we're going to play it, right? So he goes into the attic, he sees the box, and then the attic door fucking slams shut with the force of of the moon crashing into the planet. Loudest fucking thing ever. And, like, this happens all the fucking time. He's looking around the house. Something, a shadow, like, darts out in front of me. He's like, oh, my God! And, of course, the shadow darting out in front of him is accompanied by this cataclysmic fucking orchestra sting i hate orchestra string jump scares they're not fair they're artificial they are lame you know the loud noises like maybe the crashing in the attic that sucks too but at least it's a noise that would occur in the house you can buy it happening not really but you could see you could if there was a crash in the attic okay but to artificially amp up the scare with an orchestra sting is awful. It's not fair. That it, And you know, there's so many scares in this movie. They would have been so much scarier. They would have been terrifying. Terrifying if there were no orchestra stings and it took place in silence. There's this... Probably the biggest scare in the movie is Ethan Hawke is looking around, he's looking in the yard, and all of a sudden, at warp two, this fucking spooky child's head comes racing out of the darkness and is like right here, and he doesn't see it. And it's like it's like breathing on his face. It's like right here. And of course, when that happens, orchestra sting! Like the loudest orchestra sting ever. And I'm like, ah! Oh! God damn it! That would have been a million times scarier had it taken place dead silence. If this face had come rushing out of the darkness and you didn't hear it. You didn't fucking hear anything. Because Ethan Hawke doesn't hear anything. It helps you identify with the character if you hear what he hears. You understand? If you cut the soundtrack out, so much scarier. Why? Because you're not startling the audience when the face comes rushing out of the darkness. Stealthily quiet. Maybe all you hear is the sound of rushing air that's being displaced by this ghost. Whatever. If that's all you hear, that is terror. That is... That builds an atmosphere. An orchestra sting builds an atmosphere, all right. It builds the atmosphere of annoyance, and it builds the atmosphere of you being afraid of the next loud noise. I can't harp on this enough, because it is weak directing, it's weak storytelling, and it's not necessary to scare people. If anything, it hinders the scares. Now... A couple times is fine. 
and a couple of times the jump scares are really, really good. But, as evidenced by the Super 8 film, it's so much better when the experience is unconventional, when it's strange, and it's weird, and it's... it's real. You know? Like, you're watching this family get hanged, and you're like, oh my god. What? Oh my god. It's not like... If all of a sudden, like, a fucking buzzsaw blade cut the branch and hang these people, but it was accompanied by, like, these this really intense violin section doing, like, this tremolo, you'd have been like, oh, that, it, it tells us how to feel. I hate that. I hate when an orchestra tells us how to feel about a scene. It's manipulative. It's terrible. I really hope I'm getting through to you when it comes to the the nature of cinema i don't like being manipulated i don't like being told how to feel movies it should be up to you how you feel about a movie and it should be good enough that you shouldn't have to be told how to feel music is fine accompanying music is good and in fact at the last act the music is beautiful it's not pretty in the sense that it's it's nice to listen to, but it's nice in the fact that it's strange and unsettling. It's good because it creates the atmosphere. It's hard to explain unless you've seen the unless you've seen this part of the movie, but there comes a time when Ethan Hawke is like, fuck it, this is weird, I'm gonna burn the film. There's this really strange and unsettling sound. It's 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 unlike most music you've ever heard. It's not a string section. It's not like a band. It's not an orchestra. It's like this strange, weird, discordant... And I guess it does tell you how to feel a little bit, but it's weird. You're, you're like listening and you're, you're, you're on edge because this is not the, the sort of thing you normally hear. You know what I mean? It's the sort of thing... I, I guess the best thing I could explain it as is if you ever saw There Will Be Blood... And there's that scene when the uh, when the oil rig, the, the the yeah the oil thing catches on fire. There's like this weird kind of percussiony sound music that that drowns out what's actually happening, and all you're hearing is this music, and and you're not hearing you're kind of hearing off in the distance like screaming, and you're just watching uh, Daniel Plainview just kind of process what's going on from afar, and he's this music is like very strange. Um, it's a lot like the music in the movie in, uh, uh, Insidious. Uh, oh, what's the movie? Um, yeah, Insidious, where the, a lot of the music is very unconventional. And there are jump scares in Insidious, but they're earned. In fact, a lot of the scariest things in Insidious are watching that weird fucking ghost dancing through a uh, tiptoe through the tulips, I think, is actually watching it do a very happy dance. I don't remember that many orchestra stings or jump scares in that movie. I'm sure there are, but the fact that I remember more than anything else is the spooky imagery. That's where the scares come from because that's fucking scary is watching a ghost like not dancing around, but not in a funny way where it's it hard. To, it's really spooky. So the manipulative jump scares are the weakest part of that film, and it didn't need to be that way. It did so well with the Super 8 film, and the last act is where it really gets effective because as Ethan Hawke starts slipping more and more into like an unhinged state, the way he sees the world is like the Super 8 films. Like he's he's freaking out, and all of a sudden it's like the the film is edited and the film starts to shake. And is really jarringly cut. The editing is is almost genius the way it's cut, where it's the film is rattling like Super 8 in a projector, and he's like he's seeing things kind of grainy and it's weird. And it, like I said, it's unsettling. It builds an atmosphere. It's not scaring you with loud noises. That's why it's done so well. So it flirts with greatness so many times. And that orchestra's thing, you know, it's it's not it's too much. It's too much. And I uh, and. It suffers from dumb white people syndrome, where, again, this is not found footage, but there comes a point in this movie where he is seeing evidence of murders. 
he has basically cracked the case, proven that the girl he's looking for is alive. And not only that, the cases are connected to several more multiple murders stretching back to the 60s. He has direct evidence of this. Does he call the cops? No. He, he considers it, and then he puts the phone down, and there is no reason for him to do that. They justify it by, like, you can kind of read in his character voice, like, he's like, if I do this, it jeopardizes my book. He's like, I, I, I won't be able to write my book if I give this to the cops. And I'm like, no, I don't buy it. Like, Or he's like, maybe the cops won't believe. I, I don't know what he's thinking. Like, I guess he's thinking, like, I won't be able to write my book or my book will suffer because of this. But why? He's, if he shows this evidence to the cops and it's concrete, indisputable evidence that these cases are connected, the kid is probably alive, and the fact he could solve upwards of like 12 other murders, and it, and not, it would not only not harm his book, it would help immensely for his book because if he shows the cops his evidence and the cops don't, the cops don't initially believe him. If he shows them this evidence, they will help him. They would probably keep him in the loop because he was such a monumental aid to the investigation of these of these murders. Now, I I really think that. Like maybe he doesn't know, but in the context of the movie, he's not given any reason. Like, okay, Fred Williamson, the, the sheriff in the in the town, doesn't like him, but the thing is. If it's proven he's onto something, he's he's actually shown Fred Williamson doesn't like Ethan Hawke. But it's very clear from his behavior, the reason he doesn't like Ethan Hawke is because he considers Ethan to be kind of a vulture. Um, uh, desecrating the memories of this family. Kind of like, uh, he sees him as uh, making stuff up, as being like a hack writer who's who's creating controversy where there is none and he cares enough about the family he wants their spirits to rest but when ethan hawk comes up with this definite evidence he has no reason to doubt that fred williamson would then cooperate with them because he says you know he says like if there was a shred of evidence that this family was actually murdered and if there was a chance this girl was alive i would look into it but there's not this kid is dead but if he showed them evidence he'd be like god damn sir you are right you were right this whole time the sheriff's department would be at his disposal. I really believe that, you know, because he helped crack this case. And I'm like, the dumb white person example number one. Two, moving into the house. Hang on. <laughs> Oreo is losing her goddamn mind. Then, when weird shit starts to happen, indisputably weird shit, even if... You were the kind who didn't believe in ghosts or demons or paranormal shit. Example. He starts waking up in the middle of the night. He hears a noise. Okay. And he, uh, he investigates the noise and he hears the sound of his projector. Someone turned the projector on. Okay. So he goes downstairs and he, he sees the projectors on and it's showing the film. And he's like, what the fuck? So he goes over there and he turns the projector off. Now... He's like, and now maybe you think, well, the kids have always shown an interest in his, in his work, but they're not old enough to process it because what he deals in is horrific stuff. And I'm like, at first you might believe it, but then you think. I'm like, there's no way a kid knows how to set up a Super 8 projector. There's just no, I mean, I doubt the kid would even know what a Super 8 is. You know, the kid doesn't even know what a fucking VHS tape is. But I'm like, okay, well, maybe he thinks the kid turned it on. So he leaves the, he leaves his office and he locks it. He goes back to bed. And then like 10 minutes later, he hears the projector again. And he's like, what in the fuck? So he gets up, he unlocks his office, and the fucking Super 8's running again. Now, you might have chalked up the first incident to, their, to the kid. Okay, fine. Because the kid has been shown to get up and kind of sleepwalk. Fine. But he's locked the office, he's turned it off, he's probably fucking unplugged it. You know. So like, the second time around, it's either a ghost... Or there's someone in the fucking house. I think he chalks it up to someone being in the house. But does he call the cops? Nope. At some point, when he's 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 coming completely unhinged, he calls one of the deputies. And he's like, he's like, 
do you believe in ghosts? Because because I, I, I don't know anymore. And he's like he's, he's like I, there's I, I get the feeling something is in my house. I'm like no, something is definitely in your fucking house. You know, and and I'm like I don't buy this. And so the the deputy is like, look, you've moved into a multiple murderers house, or you're you moved you moved into a house where lots of murders occurred. You're probably stressed. Everyone would see demons if you were moving into a into a murderer's house. It's this case is getting in your head, and I'm like, of course, of course, it's chalked up to stress, no sleep, alcoholism. There's like a litany of excuses. Of course, nobody believes it's ghosts when he's clearly seen them several times, and so he he doesn't he doesn't, and this is actually a case where. You would set up a camera because this happens like every night. It's turning on the fucking projector, and like there's no explanation for it. Like he's he's got the office locked, and the projector keeps coming on. He actually is shown to have a DV cam. Set up the DV cam and see who's turning on your fucking projector. Like I just made the sinister makes a better paranormal activity if the guy had any brains at all. Um, um, and what's uh, what really made me mad like okay maybe i'm the only guy that is bothered by the jump scares now granted the jump scares are really well done like they are in terms of as as good as jump scares can get they're well done you know it's they're okay you know if you're in it for jump scares this will actually do because it it's it's good enough with the atmosphere of dread, the contrast, I could see it working. It didn't work for me. But I definitely see the genius in this movie. For me, though, only half the movie is genius. And that's the half that has the Super 8 stuff. Because, in a way, that's the stuff that feels the most real. The Super 8 stuff, you could see you could see this maybe happening. You know, like, the the ghost is all grainy. You can't see it. It's unsettling. It's It's dead. You can see it. Where it's artificial is the orchestra sings, the the clear, the predictable ghosts jumping out, the fact they kind of they they really overplay the spooky children aspect. And I was saying this is going to be a spoiler, but it's not. It's like it's the big reveal of the movie, but it's so not. It's anyone would get this, and anyone would get it within like the first quarter of the movie. You get this. In fact, this is where I really got annoyed with this movie, Beyond the Jump Scares, was that how does this guy, who is a true crime novelist, or a true crime, bi- I don't even know what you call it, true crime biographer or whatever like that, how does he not figure this out? Because he's he's like, okay, he moves into this house where many murders occurred, and the only person, the, the only strange thing is that the child disappears. Okay. And so he starts watching these films and they're all of murders where the entire family gets killed, but the child is missing. And then he see he starts to see this same ghost appearing in the, in the films, or, but he doesn't think it's a ghost. He thinks it's a guy. He thinks it's the same guy, but that's like, even the deputy is like, look, if, if this guy was in all these films and these murders go back to the 60s, this guy would be like 85 years old by now. And that's even a stretch, depending on how old he started this. And he's like, so either we've got like an 85-year-old guy who is somehow overpowering or drugging and, and hanging this family, which is uh, highly unlikely, or what's the only other explanation? The kid did it. And it, I'm not str- like I'm not saying I'm super smart or something. I'm saying like this is simple deductive reasoning. Like either it's this guy and it's unlikely, or the kid was somehow involved. And so it even early on, I was like the kid is somehow involved. And like and and what makes it clearer and clearer and clearer is that at every turn. Everything that is happening to this guy, everything, almost everything that's crazy happening to this guy involves the kids. The kids start acting weird. Um, in fact, there's the perfect, is that one of the first things he sees is that he's hearing this noise and he's like, what the fuck is that? So he's walking around and he sees like ghostly kids darting out. He's like, Jesus Christ, a ghostly child. And so he, uh, he, um, he sees the, one of the moving boxes and 
the, the moving box like moves and he's like what the fuck and the moving the, the moves again he's like what the fuck and jesus christ and so he's like he's approaching it real slowly and all of a sudden the box starts to open and coming out of the box like one of the ghosts in deadly premonition he sees like i can't even do it he sees like this he sees this kid come out of the box and it's like uh, uh, like, and it starts to like it like the kid like folds out of the box like backwards and starts to like scurry like it's crab walking it's like uh, and it's it's like screaming like ah uh, and it's like well he's like jesus christ what the fuck is this and so like he 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 like it's fucking scary this thing and and i'm like okay this kid like rises out of the box walking on his hands backwards his face contorted and screaming this unearthly scream <laughs> and i'm like how are you he's like oh and they they kind of really weakly justified by saying the kid has night terrors dude if these are night terrors the, the fucking hardcore night terrors like i fucking i'm damn skippy this kid has not ever climbed in a fucking moving box and then walked like crab walked out of one screaming his goddamn head off like he was possessed in the fucking exorcist like jesus and especially since the stuff he's seeing is like fucking demonic like clearly fucking demonic and like the fact he never puts two and two together to think that you know uh, maybe the kids bear watching because they all start acting really fucking weird. Like even weirder than that. They start to act like really bizarre. Like uh, it, it, one of the, oh, just, one of the first things that happens is like um, the, the same boy gets in trouble because he starts drawing like really weird pictures, like really demonic fucking pictures. Like he goes to a whiteboard and he takes a permanent marker and he draws the scene with the tree where the family gets hanged from the tree. Like he draws it fucking perfectly, you know? And, uh, and you're like, and they're like, there's no way he could have seen that. And they're like, well, maybe he like walked into my office. I forgot the log. I'm like, no, no. Like he, like, why would this kid act so fucking spooky and like vandalize a, a school whiteboard and draw this fucking satanic thing if there was nothing weird going on there they established really early on the girl the little girl likes to paint on her walls and i know you know where this is going um of course the kid starts drawing demonic shit on the walls and there's no way that the parents don't tuck this kid in at night and see the fucking hanging tree on the wall they don't fucking see the the exact same like goddamn demon drawn and scrawled on the fucking walls i'm like dude can you not figure this out like the kids are acting weird the kids are the only things that are just like what is the matter with you man uh, he's so dumb and the fact that he can't even suspect that there's something it, it, he even starts to suspect it's supernatural so like if he's suspecting it's supernatural and the kids are always disappearing maybe it has something to do with the kids the same kids by the way that are acting so fucking crazy it gets better. He gets dumber. Okay? So, he uh, he's like, he starts seeing occult symbols on the Super 8 films. And by the way, the kids are drawing the occult symbols, but, you know. So, he contacts this, uh, this professor at the university who knows, like, occult symbols. And he's like, oh, well. He's like, I, I have definitely seen these symbols before, but they're, they're really obscure. And Ethan's like, obscure? He's like, yeah, yeah, um... They actually come from ancient Babylonian uh, texts, most of which have long ago been destroyed. He's like, Babylon. He's like, yeah, Babylonian. He's like, the symbols. I had to do some look. Uh, I had to do some serious research, but the symbols you found, there's, it's, it's really bizarre. It, this isn't some like Satanist cult or some gangbangers. No, this is like hardcore deep devil stuff. Uh, the symbol you found is apparently the Babylonian god of of devouring children he says that he's like apparently this this babylonian god is well known for 
taking innocent children, corrupting their souls, and then abduct, abducting them into his nether realm where he devours them whole. And Ethan Hawke is like, eating children? And he's like, yeah, eating children. And that's why they, they say, he also said the Babylonians also were afraid that he lived somehow in pictures of him. So if you, there was a picture of him, he, that's why they burned virtually every single symbol of him. That's why the symbol is so obscure. And Ethan's like, uh, what? And he's like, the, the professor's like, you don't have any of those symbols with you, do you? And he's like, oh, uh, I don't know. And, uh, so like, he's, he's basically had it explained to him. And again, this is like undeniably supernatural shit that's happening to him. Completely. Like, there's a, there's a poisonous fucking snake like one of those uh like a coral snake like one of those like red white and black snakes that's clearly like i, I forget what's like a cotton mouth or something like that it's a coral snake like one of the deadliest snakes known to man and he sees this snake that is in his in his attic impossibly somehow in his attic and he he tells the deputy this he's like man i went up there and there was this fucking snake in my ear and he, he's like and he's like, the deputy's like, well, well, there's no way a snake could have made that banging noise in your attic. And Ethan's like, no shit. He's like, the deputy, I, I swear to God, he says this. He's like, y you know what could have made that noise? Squirrels. This crashing sound sounded like a piano exploding in his attic. Combined with the orchestra thing, yeah, it was like somebody put dynamite in a piano and blew it up in the attic. And and Ethan Hawke looks a little dubious. He's like, squirrels? And the deputy's like, yeah, squirrels. Man, they make noise. And Ethan Hawke's like, okay. I, I don't think it was squirrels, but okay. <laughs> he leaves it at that. Like, no, clearly there's some kind of like sumo match going in going on in your fucking attic because it's not fucking squirrels. But he seems to like kind of like reluctantly just go like Wh whatever i i need to finish my book so he goes on like, dude and then he gets dumber eventually he's like he sees enough spooky shit he's seeing the guy the the demon or whatever it is in his yard okay and he's like you know what fuck it we're leaving so, like, I'm supposed to think, like, he's a really smart guy for finally g getting up and leaving. Like, in Insidious. In Insidious, like, really early on, they're like, look, spooky shit is happening, the kids are getting hurt, we're leaving. And I'm like, yeah, that, you know what, that's really smart. Is because, like, in so many movies, they're like, no, we're gonna stay here, we're gonna, we're, this is, it's all in our heads. No, in Insidious, they're like, you know what, spooky shit is happening, we're leaving. So they leave. I'm supposed to think, maybe, in Sinister, like, they're really smart for eventually, like, getting the message and leaving except like it's he's he's not smart he goes back to his old house which by the way is considerably larger more gothic and spookier than the suburban house they were just in like oh this is good it's, it's like fucking wayne manor I'm like how can he afford this he hasn't had a he hasn't had a best-selling book in 10 years he lives in fucking wayne manor so like he's in this fucking place big gothic fireplace and he he actually it further gets spelled out to him where like he's he's like i gotta put this behind me i'm finally out of that fucking place that kid, nothing can catch me now our kids are safe and so he he eventually like he calls up the uh he calls up the professor and he has the shit explained to him that that scene i was telling you about but and so then the deputy who's been helping him out the deputy who actually does like him calls him up and he's like he's like i just figured it out he's like Every family that was murdered lived in the house of the previously murdered family. That's the connection. So all these people who were murdered lived in the guys lived in the previous family's house. So you lived in the previous family's house and then you left. So you're you're right in the timeline. You're next. Does he get up and like arm himself? Does he even suspect the children might be involved despite the fact that he has been flat out told that the kids are somehow like being corrupted by this demon? In fact, 
he goes and he finds in his own attic more films of the murders that could not have possibly gotten there any other way. He finds the films and he's like, I shouldn't watch these. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Okay. So he tapes together the films. He, he fixes the films and he starts watching the films. And in these films, he sees the endings, like the extended endings of the Super 8 films of the murders he just watched. And he watches the first one of the family getting hanged. And he sees it and he's like, oh my god. So he watches past the original ending, right? And he sees climbing down from the tree, holding the saw that caused the family to get hanged. You have to see it. He sees climbing down the tree, he sees the kid. And he sees the kid of the family who's like walking all robotically and walks up to the camera with like this axe. And the kid goes, shh. Does he get the message? No. He puts in the second film and he sees the family getting set on fire. And then the camera turns around and he sees the child in the family holding a gas can and like a road flare. And he, the kid was like, shh. Does he get the message? No. He goes and he watches the next film of the family getting drowned. And by the way, how'd the little kid manage to pull people forcibly into the pool? Because they weigh like 180 to 220 pounds. I don't think the kid's doing this. Anyway, so he sees the family getting drowned. And sure enough, the camera turns around and it's the kid. And the kid goes, shh. There's like five films like that. He watches all five. Does he manage to put together not only the fact that he was just told that his family is the next to be targeted. Not only is he just told that the kids are going to act spooky and something is like possessing them. Not only that, he watches every single previous murder where the kid has turned out to be the murderer of of the family does he put it together does he call the cops knowing that he's about to be targeted and maybe murdered instead he suddenly he's like oh my god he starts to feel really he turns around and it's the kid and the kid kills him kills everyone and that's the movie and sure enough just when they, just when you thought they'd leave the movie well enough alone with a genuinely spooky long shot of the box of films in the attic, which has returned, the boogeyman swings his face into the camera, huge orchestra scare, for no reason, then they crash to credits. I'm like, you couldn't let it go. You actually had a spooky ending with no jump scares, and you had to do one more. This character... The, the author character is perhaps, and this is saying something, even counting the Friday the 13th films, even counting the dumbest stoner characters in any horror movie, this character could very well be the dumbest. He's flat out told what's happening. He firsthand witnesses five straight cases of the kid committing the murders the same murder that he's investigating he's told that he's next in line he sees no pattern a fucking box turtle could have put that together i put it together before the first act wrap before any of this came to light i was like wow we're seeing several cases of murder and the kid is missing maybe the kid's involved the entire movie, he never even suspects. That is so irritating when you are so much smarter than the main character. So much smarter. This character, I'm amazed he can he's smart enough to eat without dying. Unbelievably stupid. So much so that I think, I honestly think the director realized the mystery is so bad and it's not even a mystery. They didn't even bother. Like they didn't even bother really trying to make it a reveal because really early on it's to anyone with a working frontal lobe. It is so obvious the kids are involved because 
at like the one fourth point, he is continuously haunted by ghostly, spooky fucking children. These children look like they've been drowned. They've got like black veins, demon eyes, and they're like stalking him and acting all spooky. You're like, it's the kids. It's the kids. The, the, the alive kids are acting spooky as shit. It's so infuriating that this guy does not ever even suspect. It's so fucking infuriating. And it's a shame because there's a lot to like in this movie. In fact, I kind of get, I actually understand like at some point where the guy knows that watching the movies is killing him. It's driving him mad. And even when he's decided to burn the films, when he gets more films, he he knows he shouldn't, but he's compelled. He's like, I gotta know. I I gotta see this because I gotta know what happened. That it's this is not in no way connected to the Cthulhu mythos, but it's very Lovecraftian in the sense that a lot of Lovecraftian horror, or some of it anyway. Some of my favorite horror is the sense that there's there is a truth. There's a truth out there behind this weird stuff. And you don't you don't want to know it. Because you know that knowing that truth will either kill you or worse, drive you irreparably insane. It's but but you gotta know. You you don't but, you got to. I love that. It's a puzzle that needs finishing. Even if it kills you, you got to know. You know, I love that. I Even as I was really getting mad at this guy for watching the movies when he should have been running for his life, I understood that. I love that kind of horror. And so I was like, I was really struggling with myself where I was like, I love this. I love this horror atmosphere that they're setting up because he's like, the movies are genuinely disturbing him, and he shouldn't keep watching, but he has to. You know, I was like, I love it. But it's it's not that sort of puzzle that needs solving, because the puzzle solved. You know, it's it's obvious to anyone who even watches half this movie what's going on. So it's not it's not that kind of puzzle that if you don't watch the films, it drives you mad. It's the kind of puzzle that anyone could figure out. It's one of those 30-piece puzzles you buy at the dollar store. <laughs> you buy at the dollar store it's it's a worthy plot device and one i really enjoy for a mystery much better than this and so like i said this i wanted to love this movie so much but the script i don't know if it's the script that lets it down it does partially because the mystery is not that good or at least it's not developed as well it needed rewrites this movie needed a lot of rewrites but I think what let me down the most is the directing because it's the director ultimately who put those jump scares in the movie when it didn't need them. It, it didn't need the orchestra stings. Those are manipulative. They're overmuch and it ruined the movie. It really did. Cause it, I would, it, it's so good. It is so it's genius. It's genius up to that point. Where you finally just figure out, you know, it's just going to keep having loud shit jump out at me. And you like, it, it took me out of the movie. Now, if it doesn't bother you that much, you're going to love this movie. You're going to love it a lot. Um, it bothers me. And I've, I've often found that uh, uh, even the people in Paranormal Activity 4, it was honestly about uh, nine-tenths of the people didn't like it. I, in fact, heard a lot of muttering as they were like, oh, that was fucking stupid. Um... And a lot of people go see Paranormal Activity. They're pretty easy marks, like me. Um, One-tenth, I would say, of the people were, like, really behind it. They're like, that was fucking scary. Oh, my God. that was... And I'm like, no, it wasn't scary. It was startling. And that's not the same thing. Um, I could name dozens of movies that do... That build atmosphere. That build paranoia. That build... Uh, that build that tension. That fright that feeling of powerlessness that you don't get from jump scares. Um, and there's a different kind of, there's a different kind of horror that is evoked. That's not startling. Um, there's, there's gore or torture 
And that's why I don't like torture porn. It's why I don't like Saw. It's why I don't like Hostel. I don't like any movie that involves a gratuitous amount of torture because that is not horror either. What it is, is it's gore and it's pain. And the reason it's not horror is because it's disgust. It's, it's revulsion. It's stomach churning, just it's, it's nastiness. It's, it's, again, it's not something you earn. It's just pain. And that, it's, it's scary. The threat of pain is scary. But when you push it too far, you're just showing people disgusting things. That's not scary. That's why Saw is not scary. It may be why the first movie was a little bit scary, or why it kind of built this atmosphere where you're like, this guy's fucking disgusting. If you get caught, man, you're going to die, and you're going to die slow. And you're, you're going to die horribly. And even if you get out, you're horribly, irreparably disfigured. You know, that's, that's fucking scary. But then, it really wasn't even about that anymore. It was just about murdering people in slow, gory ways. Now, gore has its place. In fact, one of my favorite horror directors is John Carpenter. And one of his goriest movies is The Thing. There's a lot of gore in The Thing. But it's, it's an alien horror. It's, the gore is the means to an end where it, it is this thing that masquerades as you. So you never know who it is. You know, that's the paranoia. That's the tension. And when discovered, it becomes this gory, alien, slimy beast that it, it's almost like it's it's the fear of death. It's not it's not there's disgust involved, but it's that kind of disgust that an alien creature and you might argue that's the same thing. It's not um, Prince of Darkness. John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. It's one of the it's it has its flaws but there's some of the scariest shit I've ever seen in a horror movie it takes place in that. And it's, I'm not going to spoil it, but there's this dream that the characters keep having of this weird church and this woman's coming out of a church and there's this weird voice that's talking and it's, you can't quite hear it. You hear, you get bits and pieces and it's this weird, it's out of place. And you're like, what the fuck is that? And you're listening real close and a lesser movie when you're listening real close. Orchestra Sting! This movie doesn't do that. It it lets it play to its conclusion and then it stops. And there's silence. Beautiful. It's beautiful how well that's executed. Um, there's there's uh, the Pang Brothers movie The Eye. It has jump scares, but it only has like two. Okay. And those are scared. Uh, those are, are earned. And you're always afraid of the next... You're afraid there's going to be another one, but it's not because it's startling. It's, it's because when they jump out, the few times the, the ghosts or the creatures, the few times they jump out, it's because they are fucking pissed. They are going to fuck you up. And so... The scariest moments in that movie are the quiet ones because you're afraid at any point it's going to get real. Like there's this scene in the, this, a lot of people remember this scene in an elevator where she's, she's trying to escape these ghosts and she's like trying to get back to her apartment. She's like, she's hammering the button and there's this really long elevator ride and the elevator is going up and up and up and it's dead silent. And all of a sudden she senses like she doesn't know, but there's this ghost back there. She's like, I can't turn around. She, if she turns around, she's going to see it. And if she sees it, the ghost is going to know she sees it. And then she's fucked. So you see this ghost and it's, you see it's floating. Like you see it's like floating like six inches over the ground. So it's not making any footfalls and it's floating. It's coming up over here. And it like, it's right here, like right in her peripheral vision. And she sees it, but she can't, if she even turns her eyes. It's, it's all, you know, it's, it, so she's like, it's so fucking scary. So fucking scary. Um, the, there's a movie called Audition, and I do not want to spoil Audition for you. I won't. Go watch the movie Audition. It's by Takashi Miike. Um, I would almost say, I don't want to spoil it for you. 
and you shouldn't spoil it for yourself. I would honestly suggest if you're going to watch Audition, have someone else. <laughs> okay, I'll just. The cover of the movie spoils too much. In fact, I've already told you too much. I've told you it's a horror movie. I've already said too much, and I'm sorry. Don't look at the cover. Don't look at the disc. I don't know how you're going to watch this movie. Have someone else get the movie. Have someone else bring it to your house. And without you seeing the cover or the DVD menu or whatever, have that person put the disc in, play the movie, call you in, and then watch the movie. Damn, I've already said too much by telling you about this movie. But it's one of the best horror movies I've ever, ever seen. I don't know how you're going to watch it. Because if you're following my advice, if you're following my advice, like you've got to be blindfolded or something to, <laughs> to have someone else, have someone else rent it or uh, get it. Oh, I know, get it on like Netflix or something, and then have someone else get it on Netflix for you. Then put the disc in, then play the yeah. I don't know. Figure out how to do it without looking at it. Like the only way, the only time you should look at it is when the movie is well and truly started playing. It's so good. And it, it it may go against something I just said about, I, I won't even say, it may go against, it, you may think it does, but it earns it, okay? It definitely, it, it, so good. So fucking good. Cronenberg. Now, you could easily argue a lot of what Cronenberg does is not technically horror, it's maybe suspense or uh, sci-fi, but it's called, I've heard it called body horror, where um, something is happening to your body, that your your body is out of control. And I know that sounds weird. Like, you don't quite understand what I'm saying if you've never seen one. But, like, if you saw something happening to your body, something really fucking weird, like all of a sudden your hands started getting gnarled and, like, like claws started coming out of your fucking hand. But, like, sometimes they disappear and sometimes they're there. And, like, you don't know if you're going insane, and you don't know if you should tell people, and, you like, you don't know, like, and it, it hurts, and you think something is happening to you, but, like, you know, it's it's hard to explain, but um, Cronenberg does so many great movies like that. Um, Shivers, which is one of the most, uh, it's, it's probably, I hate the word most unique, because that doesn't make any sense, but it's probably one of the most out there uh, takes on the zombie genre i've ever seen i've never seen a zombie genre go this way and i don't want to say i won't say any more than that but shivers hard to find worth it um the brood i actually did not like the brood but it's still worth watching because it's it it i didn't like the brood that much but it's still worth watching you know what i mean um scanners uh what the f i know i'm thinking of some other ones um oh how am I blanking on these? I don't know. Look for Cronenberg horror movies. Oh, uh, Videodrome. Videodrome is fucking awesome. And again, you could argue that's not really horror, but it's so... Oh, it is scary, you know, if that makes sense. Uh, so good. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other directors. Um, this one may not be all, for all of you. Uh, yeah, The Eye. Um, there's... Uh, uh, there's a movie called Pulse. Um, do not watch the American version of The Eye. It sucks. Uh, do not watch the American version of Pulse because it it takes everything that was good about Pulse and fucks it up. It is honestly, if you're talking betrayal, the American version of Pulse literally betrays every single thing that was good and scary. It, it just totally... It, I don't know if it betrays it or just completely misunderstands what made Pulse good. It's called Pulse or Cairo. K-A-I-R-O. Uh, um, another good one. Um, this will sound really silly. One Missed Call. Again by uh, Takashi Miike. Um, I will explain it because it's fairly obvious from the title. You know how a lot of movies kind of do this uh, demonic, like uh, virtually every household appliance has been done. Like there's a 
possessed X, you know, deathbed, the bed that eats, or the killer fridge, or what is it, the mangler that's like a possessed washing machine or something like that, the possessed elevator, the, uh, you know, everything has been done, um, except there's one missed call. Which, again, watch the Japanese or do not watch the American version. I know this makes me seem like a Japanophile. Um, it's not that. It's just that the American versions are such bad spins on the Japanese versions. Uh, the Grudge. I don't even like the Japanese version, but the American version is horrible. Um, the only good American adaptation of a Japanese horror movie that I've ever seen, and again, this will probably get me flamed, is The Ring. Um, I am actually not that big a fan of uh, Ring, uh, the uh, the Japanese version. It's, called, it's spelled Ringu, but uh, not a fan of that. It's it's scary, but I think that the the higher production values of the American version are actually very good. I, I, I think it makes the scary video a lot scarier, and I like that. The, the scary video should be legitimately unsettling, and I don't think it was that scary in the Japanese, or at least I saw the Japanese version second, but yeah, it's better. I, I think the American one is better. Um the uh yeah one missed call is a haunted cell phone i know okay i know you're rolling your eyes right now and you're like what a cell phone yes okay bear with me it's good it is so good because it's not really the cell phone okay and again this is not big spoilers because the first question you ask to anyone sane would ask is okay your cell phone is haunted you think it is you know people are dying and it's because of like the fucking cell phone your first question is throw the cell phone away right they do they throw the cell phone away it doesn't help and it's not that the cell phone like comes back like it follows them on little feet no it's not that because it's not really the phone okay um and in fact it's so good because you know how in movies like Sinister, you always ask like, well, why don't they just call the cops? Why don't they just leave? Why don't they tell their friends? Why don't they call the news? Like if something clearly scared and they got it on tape, something scary is going on, something clearly supernatural. Why don't they call the news? Get this on YouTube. Get this so everyone fucking sees it. So why don't they... Why do they spend all their time alone? If something's going to get them when they're alone, why don't they all sit in a group? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so like if there's a ghost that only gets you when they're alone, which is oftentimes a big problem for any haunted, you know, like ghost that kills you movie. Like the ghost always... Like Juwan, the grudge. Um, the ghost only gets people that who, they, for some reason, they always go in the fucking house alone or they split up and they get picked off. No, one missed call. You, you ask all these questions, okay? Why do they go off alone? Why don't they call the cops? Why don't they call the news? All these questions. Why don't they get rid of the phone? Why don't they change the number? All of these questions, they do. You know, they, they do everything a sane person in that situation with time to think would do. It's brilliant, okay? It's so good that it it not only doesn't insult your intelligence, it takes everything the audience might think, has them do it, and sees if it works, right? So, like, they uh, <clears throat> they call the cops, and there's people dying. There's there's dead people, and they're like, they they go to the cops, they show them footage, and they're like. You got to protect us. We can't explain this, but please, would you like just for the night, like our time is up. Something is going to get us. We don't know if it's supernatural, but we've been targeted. Would you please watch us? And the cops go, okay. And sure enough, the cops watch them. And then when pe when more people start dying, the news gets involved. The news reporters are like, oh my God. You're the you're the guys who are being like you're connected to the whole phone murders thing, right? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, tell you what, if if it only gets you when you're alone or whatever, we will watch you. Okay, we will. We we have security. We will. All we ask is like, we'll we'll put cameras on you. If there's anything that happens to you, we will document it. But it won't happen because there will be people watching you. Nobody will get in or out. We have like fucking commandos, like surround. Sur nothing will get in. Okay, and so like. And in fact, not only that, we've got like priests, we've got exorcists, we'll have like 
these people believe you. They will be shrining the entire place. You know, um, it's mainly like a Shinto dude who's, who's doing this. But, like, you will be surrounded at all times by people. Nothing will get you. So, like, they're like, okay. It's, it's a good idea, right? And so, some things work. Some things don't, right? So, honestly, that is not spoilers. Because I, I'm telling you, this is one of the smartest... And, and even if I describe the premise with the possessed cell phone thing, you're like, oh, please. No. It's such a good, smart movie. And it's still so scary. It It's beautiful. Um, I, I could go on all night. I'll just say one more. This is another Japanese film. Um, I sound like such a weeaboo at this point. I could think of a bunch of horror movies. Uh, I, honestly, the best horror movies I've seen are, are typically Cronenberg and John Carpenter. Uh, if I were to come up with a few more, I probably could. Um, uh, Sam Raimi's early work, I really like. I like Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2. I honestly think he... I, I actually am not a huge fan of Army of Darkness. I mean, I'm a fan of it as a comedy, but as an Evil Dead sequel, it's a betrayal. Um, yeah, John Carpenter, he calls it the Apocalypse Trilogy, which is Prince of Darkness, In the Mouth of Madness, and The Thing. Uh, all three very good. In fact, In the Mouth of Madness, if you're looking for a Cthulhu horror film, it's that. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of the better, uh, Cthulhu mythos type movies. Um, I could come up, uh, Dario Argento, he's not American, but, you know, that's one of the more Western style, um, all very good stuff. You know, Suspiria, that sort of thing. That's, that's kind of jump scary, but still Suspiria is good. Uh, yeah, I, I could probably go on. I could, uh, shit, I could make a list. That'd probably be a video all on its own. Um, but the last one I'll go on about, and this may break my rule of, I don't think it's jump scares, but it's definitely gory, is, uh, it's a Japanese movie called Infection. And it's about, uh, it's about this hospital that's about to close, and suddenly they get a very sick man who's who's ambulanced into the into the hospital, and there's something really wrong with him. And it may not be just like a normal infection. In fact, it's probably something else. And so it's a very gory movie, but it's also very psychological. And actually, it's scary in a lot of different ways because there was stuff happening in that film that I actually went on Twitter and I asked, like, would this really happen? I'll just tell you. Not a big spoiler. Um, some of the people in the hospital start going crazy, and it might be because of the infection. It might be because something supernatural is going on. And so one of the characters is this nurse. And sometimes when it comes to health care, you get good nurses and you get bad nurses. You get good doctors and bad. Some health care people really struggle with certain aspects of health care. For instance... Uh, if you've ever given blood or you've had blood taken from you for a test, I'm sure some of you, almost everyone probably has had an occurrence where the, the lab tech fucked up. They either, they either put like, they either stuck you through your vein and they didn't get the right vein or they fucked up and you started bleeding, you know, something like that. Sometimes they miss the vein completely. Something like it's, it's, some of you are like really cringing right now just thinking about it. But, um, that's why a lot of people don't like to have blood drawn or shots, you know, like, it's stuff like that. And so some nurses really have a problem with it. And so sometimes they got to really practice it. And so there's this character who's a nurse who kind of has a problem, you know, taking IVs and stuff like that. Cause it's difficult. You know, it's, it's being any kind of nurse or doctor. It's that's why they go to school for years. And that's why they have so much practice, but it's hard. So there's this nurse who is, they, they practice sometimes on like not cadavers, but uh, they do practice on cadavers, but like, they practice doing stitches on sides of uh, like uh, like pigs, or, like sides of beef. They'll practice sutures because it's like it's skin, you know. So she's practicing her sutures because there you can you you need to do them very well when you're treating injured people. So she's practicing sutures. She's practicing you know IVs, and so there comes this time when she starts to go nuts because she might have been infected. That she comes out of this. She comes out of the like the nurses station, and she's kind of got these crazy eyes. And the uh, the one of the doctors is like, are, "Are you okay?" And she's like, "I'm so much better now. I finally figured out how to put an IV in." And you see, like she's got like the most horrible fucking track marks 
all over her fucking arms, like all over. And she's like, I finally practiced and I did it. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so horrible. Like, and I'm like, it's horrible in that good way where you're like, oh shit, she's fucking out there. And so I actually, I asked, I was on Twitter and I was like, um, so there's this character who's, who's like really bad, like abysmally fucking Gomer pile bad like retarded at, at putting IVs in and sutures. And I'm like, there's no way anyone gets out of like med school. Who's that bad. Right. And I, I get a bunch of responses on Twitter that were just like, dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, no. And I'm like, no, no and the, like there was a few people who work as healthcare paramedics doctors whatever and so i i, I directly messaged them and i'm like you're fucking with me right and they're like dot 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 and i'm like shut the fuck up no and they're like yeah and, I'm like, and they're like we can't say anything but yeah and i'm like oh oh my god that was scarier than anything in the movie that like <laughs> Like, I guess every doctor has a story about dumb, some dumb fucking intern or like a nurse who is just like a complete idiot. And I'm like, don't tell me that. Don't fucking tell me that. No. I feel like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm like, no. Anyway, I've gone too far afield. Um, final verdict on Paranormal Activity 4. Shit movie absolute shit movie even if you're a fan you're probably so invested you gotta see it i'm telling you no and it's not even it's it's seriously not even worth watching if you're a fan because like i said they take the story and they punt they do nothing with the story it doesn't progress one iota not one because it's essentially a remake of two where they get, there's a kid in the house and the demon wants the kid. Punt. That's the only way I can describe it. They have nowhere to go, so they just kick off, hoping that, hoping that in five they'll have some original ideas. Not looking forward to it. Sinister? I would recommend you go see it. It irritated the shit out of me, but it's good enough that I think someone who doesn't nitpick nearly as much as I do will really, really enjoy it. I haven't seen... I, I always say this. I've never... I, I don't watch Cinema Snobs uh, reviews until I see the movie myself. I'm guessing he thought Paranormal 4 was dog shit. And I'm also guessing he really liked Sinister. I don't grudge him that, and I'm not saying he's stupid. Uh, I've only called Snob out a couple times. I honestly can see clearly why people love this movie. Not my style. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I mean, seriously, it's amazing how similar Brad and I are, and yet our tastes in movies are so radically different. I, I think our tastes in bad movies are, are like, right in, right in line, but our tastes in good movies are... I think I'm much harder to please than Brad is. Again, not insulting the guy. I think I envy... A lot of ways I envy people who... I'm hardwired to nitpick. Um, I can't let it go. So, pity me. Pray for my soul. So, uh, yeah. That's all I got. How long have I rambled? I don't know. I'm going to split this movie up, though. So, enjoy. Have a good one.